It was John Riskin who said, I believe the first test of a truly great man is his humility. humility. I do not mean by humility doubt of his own power or hesitation in speaking his opinion, but really great men have a, a feeling that the greatness is not in them but through them, that God, I'm sorry, that they could not do or be anything else than God made them. Which is the opposite of this story about two ducks and a frog. You have probably heard this. This is a classic story told many times, the story of two ducks and a frog who lived happily together in a farm pond. The best of friends, the three would amuse themselves and play together in the water hole. When the hot summer days came, however, the pond began to dry up and soon it was evident that they would have to move. This was no problem for the ducks. Because we know why. Because they could easily fly to another pond. But for the frog, that's a different situation. It was decided that they would put a stick in the bill of each duck, and the frog could hang onto it with his mouth as they flew to another pond. The plan worked well, so well, in fact, that as they were flying along, a farmer looked up in admiration and mused, well, isn't that a clever idea? I wonder who thought of it. The frog said, I did, as he plummets to the earth. A wise tongue can be a powerful tool for God's glory, while an unwise tongue is a powerful tool for evil. You could use your tongue for God's glory or use your tongue for your own glory and for sin. And pride doesn't allow us to do that. Pride will not allow us to use our tongues for God's glory. Humility will. And so that's why this morning with our tongues, it's unwise to boast of your abilities. And really I could add that you may or may not possess, but it's unwise to boast of your abilities. And that's found in verses 6 and 7. People like to boast about their accomplishments or their achievements and what they've done. It used to be, it really, when Muhammad Ali would brag, that was not commonplace as an athlete. Now it's you have so many athletes themselves are bragging and boasting. And people in their daily lives boast and brag to make themselves look superior. That's one of the reasons why people boast and brag is to feel important or superior. They give the appearance that they're highly skilled or masters at what they do. They feel that they're entitled to be in the presence of those who are in authority as well work for them. And the Bible warns against that. That's what we find in verse 6. Do not claim honor in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of great men. This verse is not saying that it's wrong to work for a king or a person of authority like a president. Otherwise, it can tr- contradict Proverbs 22.9. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. What this verse is warning about is not working for a king, or somebody in authority, or a high position, or somebody who is important in the world's eyes. What the warning is, is self-promotion, bragging and boasting. That is what the warning is all about. And why? Because if you brag and boast about your accomplishments, you run the risk of humiliation because you may not be able to do what you said you could do. You may, they may find that it's not how you presented it, your accomplishments. You can't, you can't do what you thought you could do. I mean, Jesus condemned the Pharisees for this. They promoted themselves as if they were godlier than everyone else. I mean, they fasted twi- they, when they fasted, they would fast it on the, busy, on the market days when everyone was, could see them, and they would, they would go out looking at around the city and in sackcloth and ashes and looking like that they were haggard and rag 
ragged that whether they actually fasted or not. They, they tried to give this appearance and these long prayers. And Jesus condemned them because they were self-promoting their spirituality. Matthew 23, 27, 28, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like washed white tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. A whitewashed tomb, one that is cleaned up and painted. You know, we still have some tombs that are above ground. Most times people are buried underground and and you, see, and you see their headstone. But as I drove past the one in Gerard that I see quite often, they still have some that are above ground where people are entombed. And it would be like going to paint that, clean that up as, and make it look brand new. That if we were able to, whatever we could do to clean off the, a, you know, the, just the, the dirt and everything off and make it look sparkling brand new. But we know what's inside. The same way with, as well, with, is here. They're like whitewashed tombs that, one is those whitewashed tombs served a purpose to let people know that there's a grave here, so you don't want to come in contact, make yourself unclean. But we know what's inside a tomb. If you've ever been to a president's tomb, that they have these even McKinley, you go, if you were to go to Canton, you go there and there's this huge building made out of marble. Looks beautiful. You have, you have some of his th- speeches that he said, quotes on the wall, and his accomplishments, but you know right there, as beautiful that looks, you know what's in there. That's what Jesus is saying that they were. Anyone else who promotes themselves as spiritual, that when they're not, that hear the brag and they boast and they're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness, evil and sin. They're dead inside. Corruption. But Jesus condemned them. Then there was Haman who boasted. I mean, Esther 6, 6-9. Haman came in and said to, and the king, Haman came in and the king said to him, what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? And Haman said, to him, Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? He thought that his accomplishments, accomplishments and all that, that hey, not thinking about Mordecai, not thinking about anyone else that are officials. So he suggests an idea that would cause him to look important. Then Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king desires to honor... Let them bring a royal robe which the king has worn and the horse on which the king king has ridden and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble princes and let them array in the man whom the king desired to honor and lead lead him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, Thus shall, shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. He was full of pride. And he ended up doing that for Mordecai, the one whom he wanted to, to have hanged on a gallow that he had built. But this led to his downfall. His boast and bragging in himself of thinking to himself, who would the king want to honor more than me? So here he was trying to self-promote himself, and, it, and he fell. Goliath boasted, here's a man of great stature. The, the tallest man in the Bible whom we are given how tall he is. He was close to, to 10 feet. But he's probably not the tallest because there's, the, there's, there's a king who is described as having a bed that's 15 feet long. Doesn't mean he was 15 f- feet tall, but you have a bed that, that uh, is at least that long. If you're six foot, you're not going to need a bed that that huge. But he probably was 12, 13, 14 feet tall. But Goliath, because of his size, because of the battles he won, the fear he strikes us in people's hearts, boasting and bragging, 
1 Samuel 17, 43-45, the Philistines said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his gods. Then the Philistine also said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. Here's a man who, who thought that, his, that he was superior, boasted and bragging, and taunted the God of Israel in the day... Because he would do that day after day after day. Give me someone who challenged me. And David came to him. Not because David was somehow this great warrior. But because God, but because he trusted the Lord. That he has explained to Saul that God enabled me to kill a lion and a bear. Not because David had the strength of, str- uh, strength of Samson but because he put the hope, his trust in the Lord. And we know the end result that David killed Goliath because of God's enabling, that he came in the name of the Lord of hosts. Not in David's name, he doesn't say that, but in the name of God. And then there's examples from from recent times. I wonder if you remember these from the stories in the news. In 1989, scientists Martin Fleshman and Stanley Pons announced that they achieved cold fusion, a process that could produce unlimited energy, unlimited ener- energy at room temperature. Their self-promotion led to widespread excitement and significant media coverage. However, other scientists were unable to replicate the results, and the claims were eventually discredited. This incident damaged the credibility of the researchers and set back legitimate scientific inquiry into cold fusion. They lied and self-promoted themselves, and they were seen as frauds. Or even even more recent in the news is Elizabeth Holmes. I remember this one. The founder of Theranos promoted her company as a revolutionary force in blood testing technology, she claimed that her company th- could run a wide range of tests with just a few drops of blood. And let me pause there for a moment. That would be great. Could you imagine just rather than having several vials of blood taken from you when you, when you go and get a blood, blood test, they can ra- run all these tests on just a few drops. That's what she claimed. But yet, however, it was revealed that the technology did not work as advertised, leading to a massive scandal, legal consequences, and a significant loss of trust in the tech industry. And even to, to this day, she still claims innocence. These are all examples of people who boasted and bragged. Whether it was Haman, or whether the scientists, but they boasted of what they could not accomplish. They self-promote themselves, and they were humbled for it. And so let me read to you these two verses, Proverbs 22, 9 and 25, 6. Do you seek a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. And the verse 6 of Proverbs 25, Do not claim honor in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of great men. See, the difference between these two verses is that the, in Proverbs 22.9, the man did not brag. But people saw that he was highly skilled. He went about doing what he normally does and did a good job that people were aware. I think even of the man... I can't remember his name, but who helped, there, there was, who helped build the temple. He was a highly skilled man. He was a worker in all kinds of uh, metals and stuff that the Lord enabled him, and the king brought him in, King Solomon. 
while 25-6 is a person trying to promote themselves and elevate themselves to the position that they're not qualified for and cannot deliver upon. And we have to be careful that we do not commit this sin. We won't do it in the same way as some people who try to get prestige and honor and all that, but that we overestimate our abilities just to please people or our accomplishments. That we tell someone, yeah, I can do that when we, we can't. And it just might be just the neighbor. It might be a family member. And the reality this comes down to in any situation, the root of this is pride. It's a root sin. If you remember back, we've talked before, it's been a while, but root sins and fruit sins. That a root sin is, one of the root sins I should say, is pride. That, and the sin that we're talking about today and this verse of self-promotion is a fruit of pride. It's on that tree. And we know that God hates sin. And God hates pride, which is a sin. Pride is actually a common sin. Not everybody is a thief. Not everybody is a murderer. But pride is a common sin. And we have to remember that James 4, 6 tells us, but he gives a greater grace, therefore God says, God, therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so we have to do this instead of boasting. We find that in verse 7, the, that what we are to do. For it is better that it is said to you, come up here than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince whom, you have, whom your eyes have seen. He's saying that it's better that somebody promotes you than for somebody to find out and you're demoted, humiliated in front of people. But also when we talk about being humble, the solution is not thinking of myself as garbage or a nobody. That's not humility. We don't promote ourselves, but allow... See, but what we do is we allow others to see what we're able to do and accomplish. And in God's time, He will exalt you. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And Jesus taught a parable that teaches that truth. That He spoke to the Pharisees about this. Luke 14, 7 through 11. 7 through 11. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the place of honor at the table, saying to them, When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more extinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you will both, come, both will come and say to you, Give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline. Let us sit at the last place, so that when, you're fr when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher, and then you will have the honor and the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The way of advancement is the opposite of the way the world thinks. God's ways are different. God's ways is not to promote ourselves, even though there's books written to promote yourself. But to humble yourself and seek God's kingdom first, it's to set your mind on God's things. And in God's timing, He will exalt you. But God humbles, that, humbles people who exalt themselves. That is, He demotes them who are proud. And they will end up in disgrace. So instead of boasting about ourselves, we, bo we, we really are to boast about God. We boast about what God has done, whether that's a prayer request, that how God has answered, we give Him the glory. Look what the Lord has done. And we, and we boast about Him. We boast about what God has done to save sinners, that Christ came to die for sinners, that we don't deserve that. We deserve hell. We deserve to be... That, that's where we deserve to be standing right this very moment, is in hell. But we boast about Christ who died for sinners, that He has forgiven us, that, that 
of, of so much sin. He's shown us his grace and mercy, and we boast about that, and we point people to Christ. We give the gospel to people, telling them, this is what God has done to save sinners, that you must humble yourself, you must see yourself as a sinner, and call out to him, and believe that Christ died for your sins, that he is the only way you can be forgiven, that there is no good works, you need to set aside that pride, that you're not going to be able to work for it. Other religions teach that you need to have good works in order to be accepted by God. See, it's the, uh, it, for us, it's the opposite. There's no good works that we can do. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Our good works is as filthy rags before God. It will not get us accepted. But then we're saved to do good works. We do good works to, for His glory. And so the way up is to be humble. The way down is, is through self-advancement, and you will be humbled, demoted, humiliated. And so we're not to, we, to use our words wisely for God's glory is not to boast and brag about ourselves and our accomplishments. We use it to bo- boast and brag about the Lord. We speak about God. And then it brings us to here, secondly this morning, is don't be careless with your words. That's what an unwise tongue does. A wise tongue will be careful with my words. Proverbs 25, 8. Do not go out hastily to argue your case, otherwise what will you do in the end when your neighbor humiliates you? This verse teaches the opposite of the world's thinking. In our culture, we hear about rights. Many are so quick to defend themselves against anything they see as negative against themselves. Whether it's, whether it's real or not. Some are quick to get the police involved over the littlest thing. Many, many of which are petty. I have this page-a-day calendar with real quotes and real events and such. And the one for yesterday is a real 911 call in which the caller called up 911 and asked if it is legal to shoot his neighbor because the neighbor's hedges were extending over onto his property. And so he considered that trespassing. I mean, there is a... um, There's a lot of issues with that, without even considering that maybe I could just cut these hedges back to the property line, which is lawful. But your automatic thing is to shoot your neighbor. That is wicked. But there are people who are like that. I've seen people get... There's videos that are posted on social media, this woman had a battle with her neighbor for the longest time because she thought she owned the waterway. It was a public, but it was a public waterway that came up to both of their properties. And any time her sons would go down and fish or swim, the woman was going nuts. Or even over little things, the people... And so there's thing the people do this. Back in the 80s, the only TV show that I remember about courtroom cases was the, you're probably going to know what I'm going to say, is the People's Court. Now, you can't even count on one hand how many shows are dedicated to those type of things. Whether it's to divorce or it's disputes. And if you ever watch those, they're over some of the stupidest stuff that could have been just, if people would have humbled themselves, could have been solved very easily. And so, whether or not they're right, these people are right in quick to sue, they learn what this verse teaches, that you could be humiliated even if you're in the right. And I've seen that 
on some of those shows that they have been humiliated. Humiliated. And, and this verse illustrates what's going on. And a person can be humiliated, humiliated in multiple ways. The person that they're suing might bring up something they don't want known to others. Because that can happen. That in people's anger, they may bring up something that wasn't even relevant to the case. But just because they want to humiliate them. You can make yourself look bad even if you're right because most people assume both sides are at fault in some way. You could be humiliated by losing the case because you didn't have all the facts you thought you did. You didn't know the law as well as you thought you did. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5.25, Make friends quickly with your opponent law while you're with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Humility. Settle it out, 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 out of the court. Don't let pride get in the way. That's what's going on in verses 9 through 10. Argue case with your neighbor, just like Matthew 5.25. And do not reveal the secret of another, or he who hears it will reproach you, and the evil report about you will not pass. The Bible tells you to settle your disputes before you go to court, and it's really to settle your, and really I would add, not even just before they go to court, but before anything gets out of hand. You settle them in a biblical way. Even if you need a med mediator to help you, like a, a friend, a common friend, or a neighbor, so that you both don't end up suing in court. Because what you do not want to do in your anger is reveal secrets, especially if it has nothing to do with your dispute, dispute just because you want to humiliate that person. Or they might do the same thing to you. Because people do that when they're hurt or angry. And that's the opposite of wisdom that comes from God. Walt Key says this, one should, not spear, one should not smear another's name to be... To clear his own or defendants but isn't that what we see isn't that what we find at times if you were to hear of court cases they bring up stupid stuff they try to discredit the other person that's what lawyers try to do is discredit them bring up stuff that has nothing to do with the case Proverbs 17.9 says, He who conceals his transgression seeks love, but he who repeats the matter separates intimate friends. That love covers a multitude of sins. Love conceals. Hate doesn't. Hate separates friends. And that's why we have that warning in verse 10. Because look at it again. Look at that warning. Or he who hears it will reproach you, and the evil report about you will not pass away. When you reveal something that you shouldn't, you risk ruin your re reputation pretty much permanently. All because you're angry and careless with your words. That's the way of the world. Angry and careless with their words. That they will say hurtful, evil, wicked things. But there's a better way. There's a way of humility. Because what we just seen is really the root of that, of what's going on, is pride. Because someone can't lay aside their pride to resolve a problem. That it has to be, I'm right, and there's nothing that can convince me otherwise. Even if they're totally wrong. We set aside our pride by swallowing it. This is the way that pleases God. This is the way of a believer. This is the way of the one who knows Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is the way of wisdom. This is the way to use your tongue for good. And it's by forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, 
just as God and Christ also has forgiven you. I mean, consider how much has God forgiven you versus what you have forgiven of another person. There's not really a com any comparison. I mean, when we compare it, we have a little bit here, but then we look at our own sins, it's like a mountain. I mean, think about what God has forgiven you. Over and over and over and over again, He has forgiven us. And so we forgive. And this is what we're to do. Because let us consider what do you do when you sin against a brother? And we'll also see what do you do when a brother sins against you? Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. You go and seek forgiveness. Fellowship with God is dependent upon fellowship with your brother. Therefore, restoration precedes even worship. And notice that the initiator is the offending party. The goal of the confession is restoration and to be forgiven. That here the person who has been offended is what I'm trying to say. The initiator is the person who has been offended. And the goal is restoration. What do you do when a brother sins against you? Well, Matthew 8. 15 through 17 tells you if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have your one, your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So you go to him and seek restoration. You confess your sin, and you seek to be forgiven. The first, that, the other one was you're seeking them to forgive you. You're seeking this time, I'm sorry, you're seeking to get forgiveness from, uh, I'm, I'm messing up here, <laughs> what I'm trying to do. In the first situation, you're going to them, and you're forgiving them. This one, you're going to get forgiveness from the, uh, from the other person. And there are times, you know, there are times when the best response to being wronged and sinned against is to demonstrate love by covering a multitude of sins. I mean, Proverbs 10, 12, 17, 9, and 1 Peter 4, 8 describe that. Yet when your fellowship with your brother is hindered, you must take the initiative and seek restoration immediately. Such gentle confrontation is not intended to cause strife, but to avoid it. Because the, Why? Because how do you deal with a forest fire? Do you deal with, is it best to deal with it when it's burning down a thousand acres? Or when it's small, just start it out? If you... It's best to do it when it started out. So notice the initiator is the offended party. The person who has been offended. So in both of these situations, you have these people coming to one another. In the first situation... You have the person who is, knows they've done something wrong and they know they've done something to offend the person. And it may not even be a sin necessarily. But they go and they try to work things out. And so they're trying to have, rest, they're trying to restore fellowship. So they're confessing their sins to the person that that person forgives them. The second situation is when the person has sinned against you, you go to them and show their fault in private. 
you do the when you do this you you got to avoid bitterness and gossip the whole thing about being private the goal of confrontation is restoration of the brother's fellowship with God with you with God and with you thus winning your brother I mean and the goal is never to put them in their place the goal is to win them. Galatians 6.1, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in spirit of gentleness. Each one look at yourself so that you too will not be tempted. James 5.19-20, My brethren, if any among you strays in the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. We don't retaliate. We don't put them in their place. It's with humility. It's not for sticking up for my right. It's not for setting the record straight. It's not to get something off my chest and give them a piece of my mind. Because if ever that motive is there, you don't go until you confess that to God a sin. Because such confrontations are unbiblical and they will do more harm than good. Matthew 7, 3-5 says, Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. That log versus speck, what you've done is, if your attitude is like that, it's like the log. Of, I'm going to put stick, stick up from rights. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. That's a, that is a, an unwise way to use your words. And that does harm. That's why I'm saying that a wise tongue is a useful tool for God's glory. An unwise tongue is, is going to be a tool for sin and evil. And it's going to be destructive. And so we can't be like that. We must go with gentleness and caution. It must not be with arrogance, anger, condemnation, or self-righteousness. We be gentle when we're confronting and teachable when confronted. And I want you to notice that if both parties are, are walking with God, they're going to be coming together. Because you have the person who's told who, if you know you have done something against your brother, go to them. If your brother has done something to you, go show him his fault in private. So both should be going towards each other. But I want you to consider this. Do I always need to go and confront something that bothers me? Like any normal family, a local church, or even that we should say the body of Christ, provides a lot of opportunities to simply overlook offenses or non-essential differences, especially in newer believers. And why did I say this? Why did I add as well, not just a local church, but believe the, the bride of Christ, all believers? Because we're going to come in contact with believers who are not in a, go to our local church, but we, their brothers and sisters, to go to another church. Whether they're friends or family or neighbors, we come into contact with many people. But God's Word teaches that wise believers have the sermon and love distinguished between major and minor offenses. And so we have to discern. We can't be like the world that over the littlest thing we get angry. And I have to have, and this needs to be solved my way or no way at all. Because that's pride. It, we, it's humility. So a wise tongue is a powerful tool for God's glory. And we got to use our wo- tongue wisely. It's not it's, and it's not to boast of our abilities, but to boast of God's abilities. And a, a wise tongue is not going to put my rights first. It's going to seek God's glory. And it's going to seek what is best for others as well. That here that I'm going to be careful with my words and not be hasty. But to be careful that I, that I glorify God. 